Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel. If you haven't been here before, my name is Jules. I am a non-binary and autistic pre-licensed therapist. I'm feeling a little rusty today because it's been a while since I've been back on my channel, but I wanted to come back for May because May is mental health month. Today, I thought that we could talk about borderline personality from a neurodiversity affirming lens. I feel like this is almost never talked about. If you're not familiar with the term neurodiversity, it was coined by Judy Singer. However, it's important to also reference Kasian Asasamu and Nick Walker, as they also were pioneers in the neurodiversity movement. Kasian coined the term neurodivergent, and Nick created the neurodiversity paradigm and wrote a book about it, and her book is called Neuroqueer Heresies. So we want to credit everyone. Why do we need neurodiversity? Why can't we just stick with the pathology paradigm and medical model? Well, because even though diagnoses can be validating for people and we're not trying to take labels away from people or people's self-validation and understanding, pathologizing human behavior, trauma responses, and other difficulties leads to a lot of harm and discrimination for people and especially marginalized groups. So the more marginalized you become or are, then the more at risk you could be um, in a lot of ways, right? And this especially is the case with autism, which is why a lot of folks who are self-diagnosed or self-realized do not go on to seek formal diagnosis because there's so much that could go wrong with that. When we talk about the neurodiversity movement and paradigm, people get really stuck on innate neurodivergence being the only source of neurodivergence and it's wrong. It's not up to opinion. Like I said, there were three folks that talked about this and they all, even though they have different aspects and opinions and theories, they all mutually agree that the neurodiversity paradigm and movement also incorporate acquired neurodivergence. And it's not just neurological differences, mental health conditions. It's also about um, certain medical conditions like having a traumatic brain injury because when you look at the term neurodivergent, all it's really saying is an individual whose neurotype, disability, etc., diverges from the norm. And that is such an important reframe of understanding our differences and learning how to accept and cope with them. Now, I'm not saying that people can't go into remission from certain difficulties that they have. I am a therapist. I do help people reduce distress. And I think there's a lot of misconception that the neurodiversity paradigm is saying, just have anxiety and be tortured forever. And like, don't be disabled, but it actually is not saying that at all. We want people to get help for their distress. We want people to be supported and we want people to feel more comfortable identifying as disabled because disabilities are not inherently bad or wrong. And the more people we have identifying as disabled or neurodivergent, the better we're going to be at reducing stigma. So. I needed to come on my channel and talk about this because there's been a lot of frustration for me, especially in the neurodiversity affirming provider communities. Um, and even though these folks have lived experience, they really simply just want autism and ADHD to be like, in their own separate bubble. And that's the problem because that ties into concepts like Aspie supremacy, which is basically the new Asperger's, right? And there's a huge divide in the autism community right now between folks who are non-speaking, minimally speaking, and maybe high support needs versus the autistic folks who may self-identify as low support needs and the things that they're talking about online and their advocacy. And while they're trying to get at folks who might be high masking, we're not really getting at the conversation of that masking is a privilege and it's not something that every single autistic person person is able to do to survive. Some folks are not. And if they're more marginalized than, you know, being neurodivergent, then their health and safety is going to be at risk in a lot of ways as well. If you're here and you're feeling revved up and you're like, no, mental health conditions don't count. I want you to think about if you're in the place mentally to watch this video. And I don't mean that in a pathologizing way, hence this video, but are you activated right now? Is this conversation making you feel invalidated for being autistic or ADHD or having learning disabilities, those innate forms of neurodivergence? If it is, I encourage you currently to take a break. Take some time for you, take some breaths, do your nervous system regulation, use a fidget, cry, journal. And then if you would like to, then you can come back because 
the term neurodivergent and the neurodiversity movement is supposed to include as many people as possible. It's not supposed to gatekeep. And often there's a divide between neurotypical and neurodivergent. And that is also a problem because neurotypical doesn't exist. The definition of the neurotype neurotypical is someone who reaches neuronormative standards throughout their entire lifespan, which if you're in the mental health field, you know that's not realistic. <laughs> you know it's not possible. And you've seen clients from so many different backgrounds and people that no one would ever guess that they struggle and they deal with anxiety or ADHD or whatever it is because ADHDers can mask as well. We're gonna move on. We're gonna talk about BPD. It's also BPD Awareness Month in May and I think that it's really important to talk about borderline personality in a way that's non-pathologizing, which like I said, is really hard to find. When I find social media pages of folks with lived experience, they always speak from the pathology paradigm and I'm not judging or blaming them. I don't think that they have been in the communities that I've been in that have provided them with knowledge and information to actually make this paradigm shift. And I also think because people people with BPD suffer with so much distress, they want to get rid of it. And I completely understand that. I don't want people to suffer. And that's not what this movement and paradigm are about. A friend of mine, Sherish Graff, uh, she's an ADHD therapist on Instagram, if you're interested in seeing their work, they're amazing, has proposed instead of the D in disorder in a lot of mental health conditions, we actually say disability instead. And I know if this is bringing up emotions for you, Sit with them, you're allowed to have them, you're allowed to disagree with me, but we're not gonna have a debate here. That's also a boundary I'd like to set within this conversation. So in this case, we would talk about borderline as borderline personality disability. And I think the difficulty with borderline is like that term itself, like I am a borderline is pathologizing in of itself. It is harmful. It does have, you know, sexist roots and ableist roots as well. And even though some BPDers have talked about, oh, maybe we could have a different term. It's been really hard to find one that truly encapsulates their experience and is non-pathologizing. And I think we have the same difficulty in the ADHD community as well. And we can talk about that in a separate video. When I think about borderline personality disability and I I have this fresh because I was interviewed for an article on this at work, so I figured why not talk about it on my channel. But borderline personality tends to develop from trauma. I do want to honor lived experience. Although I'm someone who reads research and went to grad school and did all those things and I think that has value, I also think that lived experience in community is important. And there are a lot of folks with BPD who say that they do not have a trauma history, that is not how it formed. They struggled with BPD traits when they were younger and then it developed into BPD later in life. And I wanna hold space for their lived experience, even though it may not be mine as someone who also has lived experience with BPD. There's lots of different types of trauma. Folks with BPD tend to go through developmental and relational trauma. Relational trauma is pretty obvious of what it means. It's any form of violation in relationships. Often for people with BPD, that can be chronic invalidation. And at other times, it just could be someone being abusive. Yes, people with BPD can and are abused just like anybody else. And also it could be in the form of bullying, which is a lot of my lived experience and where my BPD comes from. And often for folks with BPD, it has to do with their environment at home and how they were treated by their caregivers. So if there was a abuse or neglect and especially emotional neglect with that chronic invalidation, it does put someone at risk of developing BPD if they don't get the support they deserve through the difficulties that they're having. So it's important to understand the general cause. Now, developmental trauma, is any form of trauma that you go through before you are an adult. Developmental trauma is what happens to you at those younger ages. But when you become an adult and all that trauma manifests inside of you and negatively impacts your quality of life, that's when we call it complex trauma. And at the end of the day, I'm not trying to take the BPD label away from anyone. I do think it's distinctly different from CPTSD, but the way I as a therapist view any personality-based difference is that all 10 of those are CPTSD with behaviors, with traits that are uniquely different from each other, but mostly they are caused by trauma from what I have researched. When we think about BPD, we know there are nine general traits. I have a video on here where I've talked about these nine general traits, but to summarize what BPD can feel like for folks, they tend to significantly struggle with their relationships. And when we diagnose it, we tend to look at their history and if they've struggled with their relationships throughout their lifespan and there's been a lot of like chaos and tumultuous nature to their relationships more than their peers. And again, we wanna be careful because that can happen within 
a lot of forms of neurodivergence that can happen for someone who is autistic or ADHD or has PTSD. So it's not exclusive to BPD, but the traits in BPD are exclusive to that label or form of neurodivergence. Someone with BPD, because they go through so much relational and developmental trauma, typically that makes relationships really hard later on in life when they are an adult. If you've struggled to have a sense of self or have your sense of self that was being formed, accepted in your relationships, it makes sense that not only would you struggle in relationships, but you would also struggle with an established sense of self. And this is what I think is a really important difference between CPTSD and BPD, because with CPTSD, which I also have, you can be confused about who you are and struggle with self-esteem, but you can kind of do some work to uncover like, hey, that's who I am. Whereas for someone with BPD, there's so many parts protecting that core authentic self. And so that's why I think some internal family systems work or parts work can be helpful for folks with BPD who may be ready to do that trauma work and figure out all the parts of themselves that are existing to protect themselves and protect those wounded parts from coming out as often because when you work with people with BPD who haven't received formal treatment yet, they often say, I don't know who I am and who I am is just a reflection of the people in my life. A lot of their personality traits have to do with what keeps people around because a core feature of BPD is a pervasive fear of abandonment and also behaviorally going out of your way <laughs> to avoid abandonment from happening, to have as much control as one can possibly have from people leaving you. And so BPDers work really hard to maintain their relationships a lot of the time. You won't read about that online. You'll just see the bad. You'll just be hearing about splitting and things like that. And I'm, I'm not negating that folks with BPD can be abusive, but folks with any form of neurodivergence or without one <laughs> can be abusive. And we never wanna equate abuse to any diagnosis, especially cluster B. I know you don't wanna hear it yet today, but ASPD and MPD are associated with that too. Um, I have been learning a lot from the NARC community specifically, and there's a lot of overlap between some NARC traits and BPD traits, but they manifest a little differently. Which brings me to another BPD trait, which is about idealization and devaluation. And something that I've realized within my lived experience of BPD is that that isn't just something that happens where we like say, this person's so amazing, we really perceive them as like this perfect, amazing person. And then when we split, we devalue them and we don't feel like they're a good person at all. And it's really hard to be in the gray. And that really is our perception. But that experience can also happen with your sense of self. That can happen with your self-image. So just like an MPD where someone struggles with their self-esteem, but they tend to have grandiosity and an inflated sense of self, those are traits that some folks with BPD may also have that are existing as a way to protect them from the self-esteem difficulties, identity difficulties, and negative self-talk that they often endure when they're devaluing themselves. So if we're treating ourselves that way, we're seeing ourselves as amazing and awful and nothing in between because of our nervous system dysregulation, of course it's gonna be hard for us to break out of seeing other people that way. I also want to say you can't just like look at someone and know they have BPD. There's a lot of stigma in our field. Like I'm alt and I had a doctor like, oh, you, are, you must be BPD, bipolar, this and that. And actually I do not live with bipolar. So we should not be attaching stigma to folks who identify with alternative culture. I could say they might be more likely to be autistic or ADHD, but I don't think those labels are as stigmatizing as BPD. I really think it's important to understand that folks with BPD have a dysregulated nervous system from enduring so many years of trauma. They developed all these protective parts to survive, but some of them are very distressing. Like when we think of polyvagal theory, people with BPD have a lot of flight and fight responses. That devaluation of people that they have relationships with and that splitting has to do with that fight response. If they abandon someone before someone abandons them as a protective measure, that's flight. They're literally running away from the situation when you look at it that way. I don't get why we pathologize BPD like this is abnormal, this is unhealthy, this is wrong. I'm not saying it isn't unhealthy for someone and isn't affecting their quality of life and overall health, but what I am saying is when we think about the history of someone with BPD in their childhood and adolescence, their behaviors and difficulties with relationships and self-image in adulthood start to make more sense. And also, when you think about self-regulation, that isn't something that's just naturally learned. The way that we learn to self-regulate is through co-regulation. So someone with BPD didn't have anyone in their life that was very close that could not remain calm, but like kind of keep their nervous system regulated enough to co-regulate them 
then of course they never learned about self-regulation. And with chronic invalidation, it was never modeled for them how to self-validate. And that's why therapy is so helpful for folks with BPD because we provide validation and affirmation and reassurance. And because we're modeling so much compassion for someone with BPD, that models to them how to do that for themselves. And that practice might feel disingenuous at first, but it's going to be so impactful in the long term. It can take a really long time to shift identity issues and self-esteem, but these are things with the right support if you have the privilege of access to care that are very treatable. And I also want to say that folks with BPD don't all self-harm or struggle um, with SI and stuff like that. Um, that can be in their history. You can see that a lot in their teenage years, perhaps, and that's something that's in my lived experience, but I wouldn't say it's around currently as much. And that's also because I had the privilege of getting support right when that happened when I was 15 years old. Even though there's nine possible traits of BPD, you only need five out of nine for the diagnosis and four out of nine to identify with traits. And identifying that someone has traits is also just as important because maybe they still self-identify with the label. Maybe we should tailor their mental health treatment and social supports to understanding BPD because it's a label that resonates for them and a neurotype that helps them to understand their difficulties better and that they are not alone. When we look at BPD through a neurodiversity affirming lens, we say, of course people are struggling with these things. Of course people behave this way. And therapy might be a place to help them accept and cope with their difficulties, reduce distress, build self-awareness, expand on their identity and self-esteem. And of course, on a pathological level, when we return to that paradigm, someone might not check all the boxes of BPD anymore with the right supports, but it doesn't mean that they no longer relate to that label and classification, especially if it's something that they struggled with for a really long time. And people, I feel, deserve to self-identify how they want, and it gives them resources to learn tools and strategies on how to heal. It might help them to build community. Community-based care is such an important part of neurodiversity affirming practice, and instead of being so Western and individualist and saying, this is up to the individual to change. And I'm not saying that's completely incorrect, but I think it's a dialectic experience of the individual has the self energy to change, which is a term from IFS, and they deserve community-based supports. Everyone deserves community and we heal in community. We heal when we have people to talk to, to open up with, to relate to, because just like a therapist validates us, when someone validates us, we're able to self-validate and that self-validation is really powerful. It can be really challenging being a bpd -er and having your mood and emotion shift throughout the day, as we call that trait, affective instability. But again, that's very pathological and maybe someone does self-identify with pathology-based terms and I'm I'm gonna let them do that. But for me, again, those mood shifts make sense because for a BPD or they don't come out of nowhere, um, they actually come from triggers throughout the day. And if this person has a lot of relational triggers and has to go to work and has to go to school and has a partner and family and whatever at home, then they're dealing with relationships and relational issues all day long. So of course they're going to experience triggers and that's going to be very painful for them. And so I just think we need to not be afraid of BPD in our profession. I, I don't get why we're all so afraid of cluster Bs. At the end of the day, they're just people. And, you know, there are people who choose to do bad things with lots of different labels, but that doesn't describe the lived experience of so many other populations of people. And when I think about BPD, I'm speaking so much from my experience as a white autistic trans person with BPD. And maybe it's different for, you know, men with BPD, which we know is more common than we recognize. And that's because of the sexism around this diagnosis. And I'm sure it's different for BIPOC folks and folks with different religious and cultural backgrounds. And that affects a lot of our presentation and difficulties. And so as providers and as people peer supporters, we don't want to miss this. Now, I hope that you don't take my paradigm shift of looking at BPD as you have to enable any sort of abuse or distress yourself if you have someone in your life who has BPD. Just like with any other neurotype, boundaries are a healthy and important part of all relationships and we need to implement those. Yes, it could trigger someone with BPD, but that is not your responsibility. That's something that hopefully that they can work through. Even if boundaries are hard for us to hear, and I get that, I've been there, boundaries are a way that we show love and care and model how to have healthy relationships because as human beings, we all have different capacities. We can't meet 
everybody's needs. We can only meet certain needs, so we have to really focus on what we can do and be vocal about what we can't do. I also want to mention that BPDers tend to struggle with uh, dissociation that can be very severe and they can deal with a lot of paranoia and I think this is where we may see the overlap of um, someone with BPD could also be a system and could be on the OSDD spectrum or have DID and that's something I'm still learning more about and talking to the DID community but I don't think it's the stigma of oh they don't have DID they're just the borderline pretending uh, no that that's not accurate those two difficulties and neurotypes tend to co-occur together we need to see if both of them are there or not and really support the client or person or whatever role we're in accordingly I know I'm not here to like clinically go through all the traits if you want that I do have an old video on BPD I did when I was doing my let's get clinical series but I don't care as much about what the DSM says BPD is, even though I have to use that for diagnosis as a therapist. I care more about the lived experience that I hear about from marginalized groups and various communities of folks with BPD. And I think that DBT, yes, it can help, but a lot of BIPOC folks especially have been vocal about how DBT can be really hurtful to folks with BPD that have marginalized identities. And sometimes certain spiritual or religious practices for those folks who self-identify can be really impactful in helping them to have that established sense of self, to practice mindfulness, because those are all parts of DBT anyway. It's just a different, more culturally competent way of going about it. DBT has some trait management. It has some good parts to it, but it's not for everyone and that's okay. I think there's so much out there for folks with BPD for support that we haven't even scratched the surface of yet and we need to do more work around that to better support these folks. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. Please give this video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe to my channel as well and hopefully I'll have the spoons to make more videos soon. I'm seeing my psychiatrist today so I'm on supplements and I can definitely talk about that for a video at another point but I'll do that soon and I'll catch you on the flip side. Take care. Bye.